morning, I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Psalm 19. Psalm 19, and we're going to be looking at the second division, if you want to call it that, in, in this psalm. And, and it's the second symbol in the Hebrew language. It, it said Beth. It's not pronounced Beth. It's Bet. And remember we talked last week that the Aleph and the Bet, and it's where we get the word alphabet from. But one of the things and the reason that, that God's gripped me with this psalm, it's not because it's real long. It's because I want God to use this to bring forth in each one of our lives, and collectively as a church, but each one of our lives, a revival concerning His Word. We need it. I need it, and I'm guessing you need it too. And so that's what the, the, the desire is. That's how I would ask. And I don't know how long we're going to be in this. That's, that's really not the point. It may be something that we leave and come back to over a period of 50 years. <laughs> See, I try to do that. I try to, I try to base things off for a long period of time, so I got nowhere to go. So that's only Roy. Like Roy kind of gave me that attaboy wink sort of thing. And everybody else, I don't know if you're sleeping, wake up. Yeah, that was a funny joke. You should have laughed. But, but the point of it is, I realize that as we live this life and we're living, we're living our lives outside of these walls... How can we, who have been called out, the, the ecclesia, how can we who are set apart through what Christ has done for us on the cross, how are we supposed to live our lives proclaiming what Christ has done for us, proclaiming that and, and living through it? How do we navigate through a world that is passionately pushing hard against everything that should dominate our lives. How do we do that? How do we find our way through this? It's the Word of God. The Word of God is what will allow us to be able to navigate through this world that we have to live that pushes hard against Christianity, that pushes hard against God and His reality. And that's why we need a revival of it in our lives. I'm pretty sure there are a lot of people here who have walked through the woods. Am I correct in that? Okay, it doesn't take a lot. If you've walked through the woods, I think you're probably aware of this. It doesn't take a whole lot to trip you up. It can be a root, it can be a little stump, it can be a twig, it can be a hole, it can be a rock, and, and it will trip you up. Here's the funny thing. Maybe this is just me. Let, me. let me share this. If you're walking in the woods by yourself, and you trip and fall, and you jump up, what's the first thing you do? Look around. We all do that. We know nobody's maybe around us, but that's what we do. We look around and we think, who saw that? Well, guess what? There's a world that's living out here that when we stumble and fall as professing Christians, they are watching. And oftentimes they want to point and wag their fingers and say, ah, see, you're a hypocrite, all of these things. But here's the reality. When we're walking through the woods, we, we are challenged to see where the trail goes in the distance but at the same time, to look down and know exactly where our feet are stepping, to know what's right in front of us. That's why in this scripture, it talks about not what we're covering today, but, but God's word is what? A light for my feet or a lamp for my feet and a light for the path. And so we need to know how we can navigate. We need to make sure that our feet are stepping where they need to step. And remembering the whole time that God's word is living and active. That's the God that we have, and that's the scripture that we have. So I want you to follow along as we read Psalm 119, verses 9 through 16. It starts in verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Father, we humbly ask your blessings upon the word that's been read today. Father, now as, as we expound upon it, and again, Holy Spirit, you are the one that has to teach us. 
And I pray that you would do that. I pray that you would teach us what we need to hear today, what we need to be taught today concerning your word. And Father, bring forth a revival in our lives in this church concerning the word of God. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So jumping right into this. And there are some who think, and, and I kind of hold to this, that this is a psalm of David. It doesn't say that. But there are some, especially early church fathers, who say David wrote this. So there will be times I will probably mention that David said this or that. And that's, that's where that's coming from. But in verse 9, it says, How can a young man keep his way pure? I like the King James Version in this. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Matthew Henry, the Puritan, the pastor, also the commentator, says in his commentary on the Psalms, but specifically Psalm 119, he he takes that verse and he repeats it. He says, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? And then he says, cleansing implies that it's polluted. Did you catch that? David here is asking, how can a young man keep his way pure? How can he cleanse his way? It is evident that our ways are often polluted. They're they're sin-laden. Because here's the reality. Every single one of us has a sin nature that is polluting the way in which we are traveling. And the scripture says, how can a young man? But I think that the scope of this goes far beyond just young men. It goes to young women. It goes to old men. It goes to old women. It can go to children as well. But first off, I want to stay specifically with with what the text says. Young man, I'll I'll take it as as teens. We've got teens here. Think about this. Teens, what you do in your life now will make a difference. It matters in what will happen in your future. Think about this. The things and the decisions you make and the actions that you take, they can have a lasting effect. Don't think, oh, I'm just a kid. It doesn't matter. It matters. It matters in in the direction your life will go. It matters in your relationship with God. And here's the reality. Living for God now as a teenager is only going to serve you as a blessing in your future. But not living for God as a teenager now, I promise you, will cause you heartache in your future. And I speak from my own experiences. Not as if I lived for God as a teenager, but not living for God. And the heartache that caused. So recognize yourself as a teenager. Now is the time to establish your life in God and living for him. Because the decisions you make and the actions you take, they do matter. But it goes far beyond that. It also goes to us as adults today to live for God. Because here's the reality. If our way is polluted, only God. Only God is the one that can forgive and help us to turn and to repent and to get back on the path that he would have for us in our lives. Only God can do that. And here's what needs to happen. Getting in the word and letting the word get into us. It's not enough. And last week I shared, you know, I had that big stack of all those different Bibles and and what they meant to me. It's not enough to have a collection of Bibles. It means nothing. You're not going to carry those into heaven. God's not going to say, hey, uh, why don't you tell me how faithful were you in this life? Well, God, I had a lot of Bibles. No, I think what it comes down to is was the Bible in you as you lived your life here on this earth? So David says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. To guard or to take heed. To pay close attention. To take the truth of God's word to heart. That's what we need to do, to let God's word be the transforming power in our lives that takes root deep within us and bears fruit. And truly, that comes by way of the Holy Spirit. It comes by way of of yielding our lives and letting the Spirit of God use the word of God in our lives and move through us and change us and transform us. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said to Timothy Young Timothy, he wasn't so young, he's probably my age. But nonetheless, here's what he says to Timothy. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, 
along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Here's what he's saying there. Flee youthful passions. To flee. Does anybody know what it means to flee? I know what it means to look at something fleeing from me. I see a lot of it when I go hunting. You guys know, you know that. You, you come into an area and there's a deer. And guess what? That deer spots you, smells you, hears you, does something way before you know it's there. And guess what you see? Look at Karen's like nudging Kenny. We're in the same boat, brother. We're, we're there. What do you see? You see that beautiful white tail go up and then you see it springing forth. What is that deer doing? It's not moseying away from you. It's fleeing from you. And that's what deer do. Wherever the the source of a threat or danger is coming, it's going the exact opposite way. So that's what that word flee can mean. So the apostle says to Timothy, he says to us, flee youthful passions. But he doesn't just say flee and, and just run in any direction, just get away. He says flee and then pursue. Flee, you're you're leaving behind. You're running from it. But pursuing, you're running toward something. It doesn't do enough if we just say, well, I'm going to guard my life. There's lots of people who guard their lives. There's lots of people who go to live on top of mountains and go to islands and say, I won't be around people. I am guarding my life. I'm protecting it. That's not enough. We have to guard our life in the direction we're going according to the word of God. Paul says, flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, pursue faith, pursue love and peace. Are we pursuing these? It's not perfect. I wish I could stand up here and say, wow, I'm pursuing righteousness and faith and love and peace perfectly 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I can't say that. But I can say, honestly, that I'm pursuing it. I'm after it. I want to flee youthful passions and run in the direction of these things along with you guys. Because that's what the apostle says. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. That's how we're to be living our lives collectively. That's how we're to be living our lives as Christians to flee these things and to run toward God. Run toward his word. That's how we should approach it. Our lives have to be, must be transformed by the word of God. Now we come to verse 10. Verse 10 says, with my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander wander from your commandments. With my whole heart. Listen to what the prophet Jeremiah says. He says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. God is a big God, correct? He's an infinite God. He's limitless. But here's the reality. If you want a small, limited God, here's how you can get one. Seek him with just a portion of your heart. And what it means by your heart, the core of who you are. You want a small God? Then just seek him with just a little bit of your heart. The Bible here, and David is saying, with my whole heart, I seek you. Everything that is in me, I'm seeking you, God. I'm after you. I'm pursuing you. I'm passionate for you. If you do that, if you seek God with everything that is in the core of who you are, David responds, let me not wander from your commandments. If we're seeking God with everything we've got, we're not going to have time to wander from his commandments. We're going to be focused straight ahead. We're going to be looking down at our feet where our steps go as we're on this journey pursuing God. As we seek him and draw near to him and he draws near to us, there's not going to be that time to wander from his commandments. That's what we need. If you partially are seeking God, I can promise you, you will wander from his commandments. That's going to happen. Verse 11. The psalmist says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I've stored it up in my heart. Here's the reality. If you take God's word and you merely store it up in your head, this is what will result. Legalism and sin. And if you don't believe me, ask the Pharisees. The Pharisees knew the word of God. They knew the Old Testament. They knew that truth. And it's just as much truth as we have today in our scriptures. And they had it all up here. 
which produced tradition, which produced legalism, which was a form of sin. That was the manifestation of their sin nature. The Bible says here, and the psalmist is saying, I've stored it up not in my head, but in my heart. Because here's the reality when it comes to the word of God. It's a little different than grace. Grace is all sufficient, which means grace will be applied to every situation just in the right amount at the right time. But grace isn't given on loan. You don't have an account that you're just loading up with grace that you'll pull from when you need it. But the word of God is different. The word of God is opposite in this sense that you need to store it up in your heart. You need to have it in the core of who you are because I can promise you there will be a time when you need to reach into that account and pull it out. That's why the psalmist is saying this. I have stored up your word in my heart. Why would he do this? So that he could brag about how much scripture he knows? He did it because he did not want to sin against the true and living God. I want you to think about this. If you're a child of God today, you've been bought with a price. And here's how we should approach sin. We should abhor sin against a holy God. That word abhor, you know what that word means? It means regard it with disgust or hatred. That's how we should feel about when we sin against God. We ought to hate it. We ought to be disgusted by the fact that we sin against a holy God who laid down his life for us, who bought us with his precious blood. Our sin murdered Jesus, the Son of God. And I've asked this, and I may have asked it to you. I know I've asked it of of the teens at different times. Would you trade your sin for the life of Jesus? If sin, if if you're being tempted and it's right there before you, and temptation isn't sin, please remember that. But you're being tempted and it's right there before you. And you have an opportunity. Do I give into it? Do I not? I want you to think about Jesus. I want you to think about him before he was crucified. And would you take whatever this sin is and would you trade that for the life of the Son of God? I think if we start thinking about sin in that regard, those of us who are Christians, because we know, we understand fully what it means and what sin cost. It cost Jesus his very life. I think for truthful sin, and and I can't remember the phrase, I'm going to butcher it, but but it cost you more than you wanted to spend and it took you farther than you wanted to go. Is Is that right? Tina, I know you've said that before, I think, have you? Is that right? Somebody said it. Is that right? That's what sin does in our lives. And I think if we're honest about it, we will confess that that is true. Sin cost our Lord and Savior his life. But here's the reality. He traded his perfection again for our imperfection. He traded his life for our death because the Bible is clear. All have sinned, every single one of us. And in that sin, we were dead in our trespasses and our sins. And he who never sinned laid down his life for us on the cross was buried, raised from the dead so that we could put our faith and trust in him and be forever changed. That's what our Lord has done for us. Look in verse 12. David is continuing on. He says, blessed are you, Lord. O Lord, teach me your statutes. Don't just read the Bible. Be taught. And don't be taught by me. If you're being taught anything in scripture, I hope and I pray It's not from me. That's from the Holy Spirit. That's God teaching you what we are talking about. But that's God be taught by the Spirit of God. And then when you are taught truth by the Spirit of God in His Word, don't keep it in. Be a conduit. Look at what He says. He says, Bless are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. Don't keep it in. Let it flow through you. Be be a one that declares the truths of God, not only in your life and experience, but from the word of God. Be one who declares it. But then be on guard also. Because here's the question. What is coming through our lips? If we're not declaring, like David, the rules or the scriptures out of our mouth, what are we declaring? What's coming out of our lips? Listen to what Jesus says. He says, but these things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile the man. Whatever's coming out of our mouths is what's stored up in our hearts. 
Whatever comes through our lips is what is truly in the core of us. You want to know a man's heart? Listen to what's coming out of his mouth. This might very well convict us. And it might very well should convict us. What is coming out of our mouths? If stuff's coming out of your mouth that isn't proclaiming the truth of God, then you need to go deep and check and see what's in the core of who I am. And if it's not God and if it's not his truth, then that's where we need to be storing it up. Like David said, I have stored up your word in my heart. That's how we get revived by the word of God. It says in verse 14, in the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. Another convicting passage. Are you and I delighting in God's word? Do we have a complete satisfaction, a deep satisfaction and contentment of the heart in God's word as we would have in riches? Now, I had a thought about this, and I wasn't going to use it in this message. I was going to use it um, if I was going to preach on tithing, but it, but it fits. I'll use the tithing example, and then I'll transfer it over to what I'm talking about. My thought on tithing is, I want you to ask yourself this question. If everybody in the church that tithe, tithe the amount that you do, would the church be sustainable? Now think on that. But I want to transfer this now to what we're talking about here in the Word of God. If you had to tithe, the amount that you spent in the word of God, would anything be sustainable? I hope this is making sense. If you took all the amount of time that you spend in the word of God in a week and you had to give a tenth of that, would it benefit anything? Would it sustain anything? Is it sustaining you? We need to be revived. Again, we need to be revived in our lives, in our, in our souls, in the core of who we are by the word of God. We need to have a revival in how we approach the word of God. We need to have a desire to delight and to long for it, just like David did. David here is talking about, I delight. I delight in the ways of your testimonies as much as in all riches. And what this leads to is we delight ourselves in the word of God. We delight ourselves in God. And what develops is constant communion with him. It's possible to have. You know how I know it's possible to have? The Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God who lives inside of us. He doesn't leave us. He doesn't take a break. He doesn't go on vacation. He doesn't jump off of, out of me and onto Kenny and then come back. He lives inside of every single one of us. So there is a possibility of constant communion with God by and through His Holy Spirit. Do you have the Holy Spirit? Scripture is clear. If you don't have Christ, you don't have the Holy Spirit. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't have Christ. The Scripture is very plain in that. Verse 15, David says, I will meditate on your precepts. I will meditate. That doesn't mean sitting cross-legged and putting your fingers like this and making some weird noise and closing your eyes. And what he means by that is, I will think deeply on your word. I'm not just going to read it. I'm not just going to pass over it. I'm going to think deeply. I'm going I'm to consider it prayerfully. I'm going to let it transform who I am. And I will fix my eyes on your ways. I'm going to fix them here. It's interesting when you look at this, and I've got it circled here in my Bible. We're dealing with the heart. We're dealing with the lips or the mouth and the eyes. All of these things. We already know that, that, that the heart and the mouth, they're connected. But listen what Solomon says in Proverbs. He says, my son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. That word there, observe, also can mean delight in. So let God be speaking this to you right now. Let him say this to you. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes delight in my ways. That's what God wants us to do. He wants our hearts. He doesn't want just a part of it. He wants all of it. He wants all of it seeking him, all of it desperate for who he is. And he wants our eyes to delight in all of his ways. How do we know his ways? We're not blind. We don't, have, we don't take a, a spiritual cane out in front of us and hope we don't run into something. How do we know God's ways? Right here, the word of God. That's how he communicates. Debbie, you nailed it as you guys were talking about how God is, his presence is overwhelming you because you're, you're reading his word and he's communicating to us through that. 
That's what God does when we read his word. When you read his word and something jumps out at you, don't just leave it and think, wow, that really touched me. No, God touched you. God just spoke to you. That's what he does. He works through his word. What we need to do as we come to the word of God is allow Jesus to be our way, to be our truth, and to be our life. And again, letting the word of God get into us. And then finally, we come to verse 16. David again says, I will delight. I'm going to have complete satisfaction in my heart, in your statutes, in your words. I will not forget your word. When I read this, this is is a vow that David is making. David is making an honest commitment of his heart to God. And he's saying, I will delight in your word and I will not forget your word. Here's the truth. If that's our prayer, we need to add something to it. We need to say, I will delight in your word with help. And I will not forget your word with help. If you attempt to do this in your own flesh, in your own strength, and in your own power, you will not delight in his statutes. They will bog you down. You'll get tired of them. You'll put them down. And you will forget his word. But we don't have to do this in our own flesh. We have the Spirit of God. He has given us that Spirit. I've been praying it this morning. I've been praying it. I try to pray it every day where Luke said it very clearly. If we as evil men can give our children, give our sons good gifts, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? I take that verse literally and I ask for him. More of him to my heavenly father. I want more of him. David said he would delight. David said he would not forget. Why does David do this? Because he doesn't want to sin against him. He said it in verse 11. And it reminds me, and in closing I want to share this, it reminds me of Joseph in the book of Genesis. You remember Joseph? Joseph, Jacob's favored child. You remember what happened to, to Joseph? All of these things were, it was terrible what was happening to him, but every step of the way, God was there. God was faithful. God was blessing. And I want to read to you from Genesis chapter 39, beginning in verse 5 to verse 9. And I want us to see the heart of Joseph, the heart that we need to have in relation to our God. Verse 5 says, from the, from the time that he made him overseer in his house, this is speaking of Potiphar in relation to Joseph, from the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and in field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time in his master's After a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he's put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you because you are his wife. And and here's the point I'm trying to make. This is what Joseph says to her in the midst of strong temptation. He was a young man and she was relentless. He says, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? When we come to Psalm 119, David desired to delight in God's word. He made that vow that he would do it and not forget because he doesn't want to sin against God. That should be the desire of our hearts. That we should make that that commitment to God that I'm going to delight in your word with the help of your Holy Spirit. I'm not going to forget your word with the help of your Holy Spirit. Because how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against you? Because just as Potiphar's wife was tempting Joseph and to trip him up, there are a million, if not more, Potiphar's wives out there waiting to trip each one of us up. And once the word of God is in us, once it means something to us and we're letting this guide our path, we will say the same thing. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Maybe the world's already got you and you need an escape plan. Here's the reality. This is it. This tells you how to escape the clutches of the world. Maybe you're afraid of death right now. You know, I asked this to the teens and I knew when I was their age, I was petrified of death. 
And I asked them that, and almost all of them raised their hands. How, what's the plan of escape for, from death? It's right in here. It says it right in here. Don't ever forget this. Apostle Paul says this, the gospel. The gospel, the death, and burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The fact that he died on the cross for our sins, was buried, dealt with those sins, raised from the dead to live forevermore. The gospel and how we, by trusting in this, can be forgiven, cleansed, have eternal life. That gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. How do I know that? It's not just something they teach you in seminary. It's not just something I made up. The word of God tells me so. You guys remember that song? Oh, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. That's, you know, it does us well to have a childlike faith to go back to the, to the crux of that song and stand alone on the word of God. Let's pray together. Father, every single one of us here either has a Bible or has access to a Bible. But Father, maybe all of us don't understand truly that it is your word and that there is power in it, that you communicate through it. Father, wherever we are concerning your word, we're not in it enough. We're not prayerful enough about it. So however we need to be revived or even awakened, please do that. Please do that in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, through your Holy Spirit. And we'll let it fall where it will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.